Hey, I'm Jordan Gray, and this is the Intentional Life video series. From sex, relationships, communication, and character development, to health, creativity, and self-love, the Intentional Life is your go-to source for powerful, actionable advice from amazing, world-changing people. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Intentional Life video series. I'm your host, as always, Jordan Gray. And today, I'm extremely excited to have a good personal friend, Ben Greenfield, on the show. Ben, good to have you. What's shaking, Jordan? It's good to see you, man. Not too much. You as well. So, Ben, there's a million ways that I could introduce him. Uh, he's completed 10 Ironman competitions. He runs an amazing website called ben Green, BenGreenfieldFitness.com, where he talks about a plethora of topics uh, largely focused around health, wellness, longevity, fat loss. Uh, to me, one of the coolest things about him is... Pooping. Pooping, gut health, exactly. Yeah. Um, to me, one of the coolest things about Ben is how he runs such a massive, awesome, successful business where he honors all of his creative whims and also maintains being an amazing person and awesome father to two twin boys, two little superhumans in the making. So... I'm curious, I'd love to start off by asking you, what edge in your life are you currently riding? Like, what are you optimizing, studying in your health and wellness? Oh, dude, I'm constantly studying like a dozen different things. Right now, I've kind of gotten really interested in how to keep the brain turned on full blast as much as possible during the day to optimize cognitive performance. And I've found that you know that there are a ton of things that affect your your brain's performance, right? Food, movement, uh, the air you breathe, the water you drink, electricity, or the absence of it. You know, like Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, and exposure to you know uh, negative ions versus positive ions, etc. But one thing I've been playing around quite a bit with is light, um, specifically the use of different spectrums of light, like near infrared far infrared, blue green light combinations, etc., to basically target photoreceptors uh, in the ears, in the nose, um, the rods and cones in the backs of the eyes to optimize circadian rhythm and also wakefulness during the day. So like right now, I'm, I'm bathed in blue light um, in my office. I use uh, blue light bulbs called awake and alert bulbs made by a company called Lighting Science. Um, I spend about a half hour in the morning right now doing a near infrared and far infrared treatment in um, in a sauna that I built in my basement. But then I also wear these special glasses. Uh, they're called retimers, and they create like a green blue light wave spectrum that induces this huge dump of wakefulness in the morning. Um, and then when I get out of bed in the morning, I've actually been using what's called intranasal light therapy, which is literally like a, like a light that you shove up your nose. Um, and what that can do is it can actually activate mitochondria in neural tissue. So I've been playing around quite a bit with, um, with light. It's pretty crazy. Like, like what, what light can do to your body in terms of your health, um, not just of your skin, but also, uh, your brain, your wakefulness, your performance, et cetera. Oh, and then the last thing would be like a good combination of UVA and UVB exposure sometime between 10 a.m. and 2 p.m. during the day, meaning like full spectrum sunlight. Mm. I mean, you hit all those variables, um, and, and it's pretty cool to see how the body responds to the presence of light. And, and one last thing regarding that, um, what, what research showed last year was that the human body, kind of like a plant, is actually capable of producing ATP, which is our energy currency, even in the absence of calories, right? Like in the absence of, you know, whatever, pizza or chicken or sushi or whatever, if you have a combination of light exposure and what's called chlorophyll, which is like dark, dark green pigment circulating in your bloodstream, and you get chlorophyll from things like um, really, really darkly greens you would get it from like phytoplankton algae like spirulina and chlorella um, and a lot of foods that frankly a lot of people don't eat but if you can get that one two combo of really dense plant matter and good green plant matter and all this light exposure that I just got done talking about you actually create way more energy even without eating that many calories so it's really cool stuff we're just one giant plant 
That's amazing. And that's insanely well timed in my life because I was actually just at the beach uh, all day yesterday with my girlfriend. We're having this exact nice. conversation around how, you know, we both know different spiritual practitioners that talk about how you can basically live and thrive with sunlight, water, and certain breathing exercises. And I love that you brought up the uh, chlorella, spirulina, because you know, because of you, I, I eat recovery bits and energy bits uh, on a pretty close to daily basis. And I've been thinking about doing yeah. exactly that. that I, was like, I bet I can thrive with like not that many calories. Like, I like eating, but just like that idea that we can basically photosynthesize is so cool. You can totally. My wife will not kiss me though if I've eaten that LG. Like I have to rinse out my mouth and she'll know. Like if, if it's been like within the past two hours, she's like, did you eat that LG stuff? Right. But you, so, you chew yeah, yours, don't yeah. you? I have, I have to rinse pretty carefully. I do chew them. I don't swallow them. Yeah. You're, you're the only like person them. that I know that chews them. I definitely I have to like... swallow them as pills. Like I'll, I'll drink yeah. it with a really thick smoothie so I can barely feel them or taste them. Yeah, they're, they're very green tasting. They're like green slimy popcorn. Exactly. Yeah. You, you feel amazing, but yeah. Uh, for me, they, they smell like really mild cat food. So it's definitely not the most appeasing <laughs> uh, taste, but it's worth it. Um, was health and fitness always front of mind in your life or did you ever, just like in the coaching and therapeutic realm, there's a lot of like the wounded healer thing where, you know, people study what they most want to know. Like, were you a fat kid growing up or like, you know, why, why or how have you come to be so intentional about health and wellness? Well, I was kind of a nerd growing up until I got interested in tennis. You know, I played violin for 13 years. I was president of the chess club. I was into like, you know, online world of Warcraft and fantasy fiction. And that was my life. Mm. But when I started playing tennis, I mean, I was pretty young. I was like 13 years old and immediately, you know, like went down to Gart Sports and got 10 pound dumbbells and start, started, you know, running the hills behind my house, started focusing on um, what I was fueling my body with. And to answer your question pretty directly, no, I really don't have that like wounded healer um, background. I've always really for the past at least 21 years been pretty geeked out on health and fitness and studying every single way that one could get the most out of the body and the brain. And certainly my journey has taken me from a very conventional approach, you know, back in university where I got my master's degree in physiology and biomechanics, uh, but also learned quite a bit of, of, of what I would consider to be erroneous advice or at least orthodox advice on nutrition and training. Um, and, and since graduating, I've, I've really delved into how one can achieve an ideal balance of health and performance and longevity using, you know, rather than just say like the the Gatorade Sports Science Institute's um, pill of nutrition. Instead, what what really like our ancestors would have done and also what science is able to give us. And so I kind of have one foot in the ancestral living camp and one foot in the biohacking camp. But ultimately, I've always, you know, lived and breathed this stuff ever since I, I, I started my formal education. So, um, so yeah, dude, I've just been into it for freaking ever. Gotcha. Yeah, it's a pretty identical answer to what I tell people when they ask me something along those same lines of like, you know, was it a massive breakup or, you know, some childhood wounding that brought you to studying sex relationships full time? And it was pretty much just I kind of knew that I wanted to do this work when I was seven or eight years old and I just kept studying it always. So I definitely get that. So when I told my readers, viewers that I was going to be interviewing you far and beyond the biggest, uh, you know, part of the pie of questions that people wanted me to ask you about were all about uh, testosterone boosting and how to <laughs> naturally, safely, effectively uh, boost testosterone levels. And men and women were asking about this for the ultimate reason of uh, influencing or boosting sex drive and libido. Right. So, so I'm curious, what, uh, what comes to mind? What are some of the, the highest leverage, natural ways that people can boost testosterone in their bodies? Well, you know, I'm, I'm glad that you asked it that way rather than asking which supplement can you take to increase testosterone because, frankly, 
that is what I find to be the mistake a lot of people make is, is they grab the pill or the liquid or the potion first and really there are so many things you can do to increase testosterone before you turn to bioidentical hormone replacement therapy or, or a supplement or an herb. Um, so when, when we step back and look at this from a movement standpoint, there are specific movements that enhance your ability to create testosterone. Uh, what I am doing right now, walking on a treadmill, is frankly not one of them. As a matter of fact, um, chronic cardio, high levels of endurance, etc., can suppress testosterone pretty intensively because mm -hmm. they send your body the message that um, you're in like a, a nomadic state, moving from point A to point B, typically without a ton of calories present at a, at a low intensity. Hmm. And so I'm, I'm not talking about hunting or gathering or gardening. What I'm talking about uh, would be like Ironman triathlon training, marathoning, cycling, et cetera. Yeah. Um, and you know, walking on a treadmill while you're working during the day really isn't that big of a deal, you know, at a, at a super slow pace that really is more like hunting or gathering or gardening or something our ancestors would have done. But, um, like medium intensity, steady state cardio, long treadmill runs, long bike rides, long swims, stuff like that definitely suppresses testosterone. My testosterone, total testosterone was at about 300 when I was competing in Ironman and literally within four months changing nothing aside from quitting, you know, the, those long weekend workouts, my testosterone doubled up into the mid 600s just by stopping the chronic cardio. Hmm. Um, what, what do you replace it with? The two forms of movement that have been shown to cause both an acute and a chronic increase in testosterone. That would be sprints and heavy weightlifting. So heavy weightlifting, what I mean by that would be doing something in a range of three to eight repetitions, preferably with like a 90 second to a two minute recovery period in between exercises with a specific focus on the legs. There's something about leg based exercise that causes an increase in not just testosterone, but also growth hormone. So um, an example of a good workout program would be something like um, there, there's one called Strong Lifts 5x5 five five program where you do five sets of five repetitions of a handful of full body multi-joint exercises that definitely incorporate the legs. So an example of a workout like this would be you're going to go to the gym, you're going to do a quick warm up and then you've got uh, five sets of five deadlifts, squats, overhead press, uh, pull up and a uh, walking lunge. And in between each of those for like the 90 second to the two minute recovery period in between each of those, rather than just sitting on your butt or watching TV at the gym or reading men's health or women's health, uh, while you're, while you're slumped over on the bench, you do mobility exercises. So I'm all about using every minute that you have available to doing your workout um, to make your body better. So that means if I'm recovering and just did a workout like this in, in the hotel gym a few days ago when I was traveling, if I'm recovering from a set of deadlifts rather than just sitting or walking or talking, I will get into a crawl position and do like opposite arm, opposite leg extensions, or rather than, you know, sitting around in between a set of squats, I'll do some arm swings and leg swings to increase mobility in the arms and the legs. So you use every minute of the workout, but the important thing to realize is that there's no way you can lift heavy enough to boost testosterone or growth hormone unless you actually give yourself those recovery periods. So you can't do it like a CrossFit workout where you're just like boom, 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 exercise to exercise to exercise, um, doing it as like an AMRAP, which would be like as many rounds as possible for X period of time. Instead, slow, controlled, heavy with long rest periods is the way to go if you want to increase testosterone with your workout. One other thing uh, before I address the, the sprinting portion of movement, and that would be that – um, in many cases, musculoskeletal recovery from a workout like that will occur within about 48 hours. But for myself, for the clients that I work with, for the people who I advise, um, for the articles I read on my site about recovery, I'm also a big, big fan of tracking your neuromuscular recovery, not just your musculoskeletal recovery. So what I mean by that is that your, your nervous system takes longer to recover from a heavy hard workout than your muscular system and this is important because if you overtax that your nervous system it can affect your adrenal pituitary axis and it can affect your testosterone production so I'm a fan of tracking what is called heart rate variability 
or HRV. Uh, I, I could you know talk for a long time about HRV, but in a nutshell, it is a measurement that you can take that tells you whether or not your sympathetic and your parasympathetic nervous systems are recovered from a training bout. Um, it's a simple five-minute measurement you can do every morning. I don't do a lot of self-quantification. I don't walk around with electrodes strapped to my head measuring my brain waves all the time. But I do for five minutes in the morning. I measure my heart rate variability. And what I've found is that in, for most people, it's about 72 hours of recovery that it takes to recover from like a hard and heavy weight training workout designed to increase testosterone and growth hormone. So long story short, what that means is that you'd be looking at about two of these type of workouts per week, right? So for example, like a, a Monday and a Thursday or a Tuesday and a Saturday. So we're, we're not talking about like four to five days a week, full body, five by five. We're talking about a couple times a week lifting heavy. Um, number two would be sprinting. Um, sprinting would be specifically sprinting at for a length of time that targets what is called your phosphogenic energy system. So we have our aerobic, go long energy system. We also have an energy system called our glycolytic energy system, which would be what we use to tap into like glucose and carbohydrates. So uh, an example of the former would be running for 60 minutes. An example of the latter would be uh, 800 meters on the track where you're running for like two minutes. But what we're actually trying to target to increase testosterone would be the phosphogenic system, which is where your body's just splitting creatine to use that for energy. It's, it's not draining at all, but it gives your body just that brief burst of intensity that causes a release of testosterone. So this is typically the 10 to 30 second interval time range. So an example of a workout would be you're going to do um, 10 30-second sprints on the treadmill with full recovery in between each. Okay, so you could, you could set a treadmill at, say, like, whatever, 9 miles an hour on a 9% incline and just set it to go. You hop on, you run for 30 seconds. You hop off, you walk around the gym, walk it off, recover, catch your breath. Full recovery take, meaning like your heart rate, heart beat goes to like resting rate recovery? Well, t typically what, you, what you'll what you find is that about a 1 to 3 to a 1 to 4 work to rest ratio is what most people can handle for this kind of intensity. So, for example, 30 seconds of sprinting, 90 seconds to 2 minutes of walking it off, right? Okay. And, and if I'm doing a workout like this, I'm literally just kind of walking around the gym, you know, I'm, I'm listening to a podcast or an audio book. So I'm still getting smarter as I'm, as I'm walking it off. You could do some of the mobility stuff that I talked about earlier. Another example would be, um, maybe you're going to put on your, your favorite TV show that you want to catch up on. You're going to hop on a bike and you're going to do, um, eight 20 second all out sprints on the bike. Um, and, and you're going to do full recovery after each of those. That would be another example. Variety of ways that you can you can do the sprinting but again about twice a week doing some form of sprinting along with twice a week doing some form of heavy lifting are both two ways to to really boost testosterone with the type of movement protocol that you do we could talk for a long time about exercise but th those would be your two biggest wins when it comes to movement two clarifying questions on those first one was in the five by five by five are you doing five sets of each of those heavy exercises? Like if you're doing three date repetitions, you're doing five sets of that? So in a typical five by five workout, it's three to five sets. Okay. So right around that. We kind of, I mean, if you're doing five sets of five reps of five different exercises and you're resting for 90 seconds to two minutes, that's like an hour long workout, right? right? So it depends on how much time you have. But, but generally, if you're only doing it twice a week anyways, you know, ideally, it's going to take you about an hour or so. So five sets of five reps is best. And so purely, strictly optimizing for testosterone boosting, if you're doing two of the heavy workouts per week and two of the sprinting exercises on opposing days, on the neurological level, does the, the, do the sprint days not affect that parasympath parasympathetic thing you were talking about? Or yeah. is it fine for your cortisol and adrenals? Yeah, I mean, just imagine like a 30-second sprint on a treadmill. How many reps are your legs doing? Well, like 100 maybe? Yeah. So, so it's actually a totally different energy system. And you can handle doing like Monday lifts, Tuesday sprints, Wednesday's maybe going to be a mobility day, um, Thursday lift, Friday sprints, you know, Saturday and Sunday might be your play days, et cetera. So, 
Okay. A lot of different ways we can wrangle this, and, and frankly, sometimes it depends. Like if you're training for, let's say, you know, whatever, a Spartan race or an obstacle training race, there, there's probably going to be another couple days in there where you're doing like, you know, monkey bars and a trail run and all this other stuff. So it really depends on the person. But you should at least be doing some type of heavy lifting twice a week, some type of short range sprinting twice a week. Okay. And so. outside of exercise, anything in terms of nutrition or sleep optimization for testosterone? Yeah, and, and sleep would definitely be a, a big, big second. I'm a huge fan of sleep, and not just sleep, but optimization of sleep cycles. So, Jordan, you're, you're sporting the blue light blocking glasses, which, which is a good idea. Um, not during the day, though. Yeah. Uh, so during the day, you want to be bathed in a lot of those light sources that I recommended, specifically the combination of UVA and UVB light, because what happens is it's kind of fascinating when you get exposed to adequate amounts of light you know such as the type of outdoor light our ancestors would have experienced for long periods of time during the day what that does is it makes your body less sensitive to artificial light at night like blue light from screens kindles TVs etc so you actually can undo some of the damage of living in a modern environment by just making sure that you get exposed to good amounts of light during the day so that you're not inside you know in the dark in a basement, in an office, et cetera, during the day, but really going out of your way to either use technology like light producing devices such as, you know, light producing glasses, um, blue light boxes, intranasal light saunas, et cetera, or just getting outside into the sunlight or both to really get a lot of bright light during the day. And then at night, it's the complete opposite approach, right? You, you limit blue light, you buy bulbs for your bedroom that only produce light in the red light wave spectrum. Um, you uh, you know you wear the blue light blocking glasses. You install flux on your computer, etc. You know sleep hygiene. Very very basic sleep hygiene is you want quiet. You want absence of light. You want a slightly cooler temperature, like sixty to sixty eight degrees. Um, and, and those 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 are those are the biggies when it comes to sleep. And then you know there there are a lot of other things that that you could look at in terms of optimizing sleep cycles, but. Um, a few of the things that I've found to be very, very helpful are, first of all, um, there's kind of a myth out there that some people are night owls and some people are early birds and some people do best till midnight, etc. If you look at old Chinese calendars, if you look at uh, circadian biology and how our bodies actually release certain hormones at certain times of day, the ideal sleep time is sometime between about 9 and 10 p.m. The ideal wake time is sometime between about 5 and 6 a.m. So if you can set up your life for that, you're setting yourself up to be hormonally successful if, if your number one goal is to increase testosterone. Mm -hmm. So um, based on that, uh, you know, if you have difficulty sleeping and I obviously limit blue light, I am a fan of using nutrients to help you with sleep. I like microdosing with a little bit of melatonin. Um, I like on a daily basis. Uh, yeah, I'll use larger amounts when I travel, mm -hmm. and if I've been traveling a ton, I'll even reset my circadian rhythm by taking 30 to 40 milligrams of melatonin just for one to two nights in a row to kind of like push the body back into its normal sleep cycle. Mm -hmm. But usually, um, for example, one of the one of the sleep supplements that I use is just this little packet of powder. It's called it used to be called Sleep Cocktail. Now it's called Sleep Remedy, but it's very very small, like microdoses of melatonin. And then also it has something called pH GABA in it. GABA uh, is, is gamma aminobutyric acid. It is an inhibitory neurotransmitter. Usually in most forms it wouldn't cross your blood-brain barrier. But in this pH GABA form it actually crosses your blood-brain barrier and assists with sleep. So I do that at night. And then the other supplement that I take at night is cannabidiol or CBD, which is just basically like a, a legal form of, of uh, weed derived from industrial hemp. So I'll take three to four capsules of that with some sleep cocktail and then just completely eliminate blue light, get the temperature of the room dialed down to about 60 to 68 degrees. I use um, like a wraparound sleep mask mm -hmm. and some, uh, if I'm at home, yeah, exactly. The sleep mask or sleep mask is a, is a really good one because it's just like this pillow for your whole face. I, I like blackout curtains. Um, if I'm traveling and I'm in like a hotel room, I just unplug as much as possible in the hotel room because even the little lights from like the TV and the alarm clock and stuff like that, they hit the photoreceptors on your skin and they can inhibit you from getting like really good deep quality sleep. 
Um, and then I'll even use what are called binaural beats. So I use an app called Sleepstream, which is an app that can play sounds that kind of like lull your brain into delta brainwave production. Um, the last thing that I use for sleep is uh, I use a device now called a Delta Sleeper, which is a very, very low intensity, what's called pulsed electromagnetic field therapy or PEMF. You place it over your collarbone, your brachial plexus, or over your third eye chakra. And what it does is it emits this very, very weak, safe signal that causes your body or your brain specifically to get lulled into that delta brainwave production, that deep sleep production. So it stays on for about 22 minutes and then turns off. Um, I wrote an article recently on my site about how sleep cycles work in which I talk about some of these pre-sleep nutrients and also like low intensity uh, PMF or pulsed electromagnetic field therapy. So um, that would be a good a good starting point. I can send you the link to that. But ultimately, you know, it's a really long answer to your question. But yes, sleep and specifically really optimized sleep cycles, um, getting a good eight to nine hours of sleep per 24 hour sleep cycle. However, you achieve that, you know, seven hours at night, hour long nap in the afternoon you know, nine hours at night, whatever it is that you can do, that really, really helps with testosterone and growth hormone production as well. So um, from a movement standpoint, sprint and heavy lifting, from a sleep standpoint, something close to a 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. sleep cycle with different strategies to ensure that the sleep that you get is not just laying in bed with your sleep cycles disrupted, but is instead laying in bed producing as much melatonin as freaking possible. So, uh, so that would be a for, for sleep, and I can talk about food too if you want, but I don't know if you have any questions about the about the sleep stuff. I just had one comment on it that you know I do ninety five percent of all the writing I've ever done between four a.m. and six thirty, and whenever I tell in the morning, whenever I tell people that, they're just like they're blown away, like what? Like I'm not an early I'm not a early riser. How can you wake up so early? And like I've never used an alarm for it. That's just when my body wakes up. And so yeah, it was very just selfishly, it was very validating to hear that the most normal sleep cycle on a hormonal level is, you know, something around 10 to 6 or 9 to 5, because that's always when my body has told me like, okay, it's between 9 and 10, you're getting tired now. And getting up yeah. at 4 a.m., it's never taken any effort. It just, this is when I'm up and ready and when my creative mind is also the most active. So that's yeah. very cool to hear. Yeah. And occasionally like getting up super early has come back to buy me. Like I've trained my body sometimes to get up too early, in which case it's kind of fascinating. You can retrain your body. So what I mean by that is if you wake up at 4 a.m. and you're like, dude, I freaking want to sleep until like 6 a.m. I don't want to get up at 4 a.m. I, I want those extra two hours. Mm -hmm. My body just wants to get up at 4 a.m. Well, what you can do is you get up at 4 a.m., but you actually wear the blue light blocking glasses and you stay in a relatively dark environment and you work in a dark environment. You do whatever it is that you're doing in a dark environment. And then when the time comes that you actually do want to wake up, when the time comes that you actually is, is like the your, your ideal wake time, then you just get exposed to a ton of blue light. Like you put on the blue light producing glasses or you go outside and you stare into direct sunlight for like five minutes or you send your body some kind of big blast of light and that gives your body the message. And that's also when you would time a meal, by the way. that all, all that will give your body the message that that's the new wake time. That 4 a.m. is the old wake time. And once you do that for a few days, you can literally, it's called shifting your circadian rhythm forward. So it can work really well for people who just like wake up super early and get frustrated because they're waking up like almost too early because I know that happens to, to some people and they, and they just want more sleep. So, right. um, so food. Um, yeah, food is a biggie. And I mean, like, I'd probably be insulting people's intelligence at this point these days if I said that eating enough fat helps with your hormones because most people know that. Um, you know, most people realize that, you know, that uh, fat is no longer enormously implicated when it comes to cardiovascular disease and health, and really, sugar is the bigger issue. Um, but when it comes to fat, you know what what types of fat are best for doing things like supporting uh, hormonal precursors or cell membranes or cholesterol? Um, well, a, a few things that you want to focus on. First of all, um, if you get your blood cholesterol tested, do not freak out if your total cholesterol is above 200. I purposefully keep my cholesterol above 200 because of the effects on hormones and also the effects on IQ. 
Um, this is why people who are who are vegans or vegetarians need to be careful to include enough fat in their diet to boost that cholesterol very, very high. So total cholesterol should be above 200. As long as your blood sugar is controlled, as long as your triglycerides, which would get out of control if you're doing lots of, say, like vegetable oil or high fructose corn syrup, um, are under control, and as long as the inflammation is low because you're recovering well and you're being careful with, you know, not to live a toxic lifestyle and getting herbs like turmeric and ginger and garlic in your diet, as long as you're controlling inflammation, blood sugar, and triglycerides, high cholesterol is not an issue. High cholesterol is not atherosclerotic, for example. Um, the only population that would need to be careful would be there. There, there's a very, very small subset of the population who has a, a variant of the ApoE gene that causes them to be cholesterol storers. And I've seen such people like get on a high fat, like hormonally supporting diet, and their cholesterol will go up to like 500 or 600. That's about the only population that would need to be careful and would need to perhaps choose a more plant-rich, lower-fat diet. And unfortunately, it's going to be an uphill battle for them. Is that to like a, their, less than 1% of the population, like a small? It actually comes out to, I believe, to about 8 to 9%. Okay. Um, you can get this tested via 23andMe. Um, so uh, when you get your 23andMe test, depending on whether or not you've already done that test, it's a very simple salivary test that you can order to your home. The FDA will release or, or can be restrictive on the type of health data that will release. However, uh, no matter when you've gotten your 23andMe data, you have access to the raw results and you can export that raw data to another website called Promethease. That's P-R-O-M-E-T-H-E-A-S-E. And when you export your data to Promethease, you can actually go look at any of your gene variants from like, you know, your, your risk for going bald to your risk for, you know, diabetes or prostate cancer to, to, you know, how much of a propensity you have for getting addicted to cocaine, like anything you'd ever freaking want to know about your body you can get. It costs five bucks right now, I think, to export the data to Promethease. So well worth it. But ultimately, you know, that that's a little bit of a rabbit hole. But be careful with the high fat thing if you do have the the four four variant of the ApoE gene. It makes you a cholesterol storer. You'd probably do very well uh, in ancestral times going for extremely long periods of time without food. But at the same time you do have to be careful with a high fat diet. Um, however, let's say you don't fall into that category. You want to keep your cholesterol above two hundred, preferably and um, some of the best foods to support a like a, a hormonally rich scenario. Uh, one would be egg yolks. Um, egg yolks, lightly cooked, preferably in the presence of the egg. Egg white omelets and egg whites out of the card. That's one of the worst things that you can do. The full egg is very, very rich in vitamin A, vitamin D, vitamin K. So like a good like cage-free egg rich in omega-3 fatty acids. That's one really, really good thing to include. Uh, bone broth. Bone broth preferably with like still a lot of the fats and stuff in it. That's really good too. There's a lot of like organic bone broth companies that are now shipping bone broths mm -hmm. to people. So that's another really, really good source of fatty acids. It's a good source of glycine. And this is important because uh, you may have seen a lot of the research that shows that meat may be implicated for cancer risk. Uh, like red meat, for example, increases cancer is a headline that, that I saw quite a bit last year. The issue there is that we tend to eat these days sources of meat that are very rich in, in an amino acid called methionine. This would be like lean chicken breast, uh, steak, pork, etc., our ancestors would have eaten not just those meats, but they also would have eaten more of the organ meats, the bone bras, the bone marrow, a lot of these other parts of the animal that tend to be rich in not just methionine, but another amino acid called glycine. And it is methionine in the absence of glycine that can make meat unhealthy. And that is why it's important if you're going to do meat and especially if you're going to do a lot of these hormonally supporting meats to go out of your way to not just do like steak and chicken and pork and stuff like that but to include bone broth. Um, there are some other good sources too. Uh, head cheese, uh, liverwurst, these type of meat uh, mixes that have like the liver and the kidney and all the other kind of like organ components of the animal. That's really important as well. Um, 
there's a, there's a few different bone broth companies. I have some listed at Greenfield Fitness Systems that will ship bone broth to your house. It's also very easy to make um, with just like a, a chicken carcass or any number of bones from the butcher. To do, and all you need is a crock pot really. Um, there's also a company called U.S. Wellness Meats that makes really, really good mixes of these organ meats that can be difficult to make taste good like kidney and heart and liver and stuff like that. But all of these, man, you want to increase testosterone, start eating organ meats. It's one of the best ways to do it. So we've got eggs. We've got bone broth. We've got um, organ meats. If you really can't stand the taste of them, uh, you can always, you know, shortcut from a supplement standpoint and take like, you know, desiccated uh, uh, liver extract, thyroid extract powders, etc. But getting getting stuff from from the whole animal is is superior when it comes to that type of thing. Um, some plant based fats are okay. Uh, they're they're not quite as rich in the fatty acids that can help to support hormone formation. But including things like avocados, olives, and olive oil, um, avocado oil, seeds, nuts, you know, chia seeds, pumpkin seeds, almonds, etc. All of those are pretty important. Um, you you want to be careful not to overdo uh, some of the nut and seed-based fats because they can be high in omega-6 fatty acids, which can be a little bit inflammatory. The way I like to think about seeds and nuts is if you had to like shell them yourself, how many would you eat? You know, how much nut butter or how much of that jar of almond butter would you eat if you had to shell all those almonds yourself? And you'd, you'd be surprised at how quickly that can add up. Of all the nuts that are out there in terms of the ones that are best for testosterone, um, you'd want to be looking for the ones that contain lots of zinc and selenium. Two of the good ones uh, for seeds would be pumpkin seeds and for nuts would be Brazil nuts. Um, Brazil nuts uh, notoriously tend to be rancid or moldy. So I, I would buy them in the shell from a website like nuts.com or from Amazon and then keep them in the freezer where they can't get moldy and then just shell three to five of those a day. And those can be really, really good for testosterone. Um, Avocados, again, very, very good. Nature gives us clues. They look like testicles. They actually can be uh, they can be good. I believe uh, is it guacamole? They're, they're, I believe I, th I think it might be guacamole that that's like actually a word that means something like testosterone soup or something like that. but it's really interesting. So avocados aren't that bad. Um, but basically the the from from a plant-based perspective, most plant-based fats are going to be good. Just be careful. Uh, not to overdo the seeds and the nuts. Um, those would be some of the major fat sources. You know, butter is okay. A lot of people do the whole bulletproof coffee thing. Just be careful with the butter, as excess of butter can shove your triglycerides up really, really high, which can be an isolated risk factor for heart disease. So I wouldn't overdo the butter. I also wouldn't overdo a lot of the dairy fats, um, just because those can be a little bit inflammatory if done in excess. So I am a big fan of fermented dairy, like yogurts and hard cheeses and kefir and stuff like that. But I'm pretty careful. I use dairy as more of a condiment just because it can be a little bit inflammatory in excess. It's very, very insulinogenic, which means that it causes a big release of insulin. And you want to be kind to your pancreas and you want to maintain your insulin sensitivity. So I'm kind of careful with dairy. I don't do a lot of it, but little amounts here and there. You know, dairy will go a long way. Um, it was designed to turn small mammals into big mammals, though. So if your goal is to you know, stay ripped and, and not gain a bunch of weight but still get all the benefits from dairy, think of dairy as more like a condiment, you know, like ketchup or mustard, than as a staple in the diet. Um, so those would be some of the major, major food strategies for increasing testosterone. Um, what kind of questions do you have based on that stuff? Coming back to eggs, is there a general weekly limit that people should be staying mm -hmm. beneath or are the rules around that kind uh, of non-existent now if you're eating high quality eggs? So I personally only do about three to four eggs a week. That's just me personally. Mm. My kids have more than that. Like we have a huge flock of chickens outside. So there's plenty of eggs around the Greenfield house. But um, you can be tested for egg sensitivity. There's a really, really good lab that does really good like gold standard testing for proteins. A, a lot of, of labs that test for food allergies, they'll test your blood cells, your white blood cell sensitivity to a protein that's isolated from the raw food source like raw eggs or raw pork or raw chicken. 
and almost everybody tends to have some kind of sensitivity to the raw form of a protein and so you'll do like an Elise uh, or an Alcap blood test and you'll come back with like 300 foods that you're freaking not supposed to eat and it's really annoying and a lot of times it's not because you're allergic to those foods, it's because you're allergic to the form of those foods that they use for that test. Yeah. There's a company called Cyrex, C-Y-R-E-X, that does really, really accurate testing for everything from like gluten sensitivity testing to lactose to eggs, etc. I've tested a little bit sensitive to eggs, so I'm careful with my own egg exposure. So the, the, the ultimate answer is it kind of depends. Like some people just don't feel well when they do a lot of eggs. Um, ultimately, I'd say we live in a day and age where you can get really, really good, accurate lab testing to see what your egg allergy or other food sensitivities might be. So that'd be a, a test worth spending your money on. Um, unfortunately, it's not one of those tests you can order to your house. You actually have to have a, a doctor order it. Um, but you could look up any number of different functional medicine practitioners. There's one guy who sells them online from his site, um, Dr. Tom O'Brien. It's thedr.com, T-H-E-D-R.com. He's one of the, the few guys I know who who like has the ability to sell Cyrex lab tests from his site. Um, but ultimately, you know, the, the, the answer to your question is get tested for egg sensitivity or limit egg consumption and, and just work in all these other fats too. You don't need a lot of eggs. Like eggs will go a long way if you average like, you know, one a day or every two days. That's, that's pretty good as far as eggs go. Hmm. I'm really surprised by that because, uh, you know, I definitely have gone about this in a very unscientific way. I haven't gotten tested for sensitivity to them, but for me, I know that one of the most predictable ways that I can experience a huge boost in testosterone, which I feel uh, as a boost in my creativity and a boost in my sex drive, like within, you know, within 12 to 24 hours is do a very like squat heavy, you know, heavy lifting leg day and have three to four eggs with grass and mm. butter in one sitting. And like mm. that night I'll be so creative slash so horny that like I won't be able to function without writing and or having sex. Yeah, you're probably you you probably don't have much of a food sensitivity or food allergy reaction to eggs. Okay. Like I do. You know, for me, I would I would have that same reaction, but for me it'd be like a big piece of fish with some avocado or guacamole. Like that'd be more of the way that I'd go personally. Gotcha. Okay. Uh on a, a bit of a tangent, a few people asked not as many about the general testosterone uh tangent, but a few people asked that because they had been following, and if anyone's been following my stuff closely for the last uh, six months especially, I've mentioned Ben's articles in multiple uh, pieces of mine around testosterone boosting, that because they'd implemented a lot of the changes that I'd been talking about, they had been having more sex, and these are generally people over 40 that are now experiencing joint pain because, you know, for example, they're having hours of missionary position sex, and then they <laughs> stop and they go, oh, my knees are really... Uh, there's like a lot of, uh, you know, hip pain, joint pain, knee pain. And so, you know, I like that you did sprinkle a few things about anti-inflammatory uh, through the nutrition advice throughout. But uh, as a bit of a tangent, is there any, you know, high leverage, really important uh, tips, tricks and tactics around uh, joint pain, whether that's around inflammation or, you know, something about targeting joints? Yeah, Absolutely. So um, the, the three most important things that you can do for your joints based on the way that joints degrade. Joints degrade typically due to compression, due to lack of mobility, and due to lack of tensile integrity of the tendons and the ligaments that are supposed to be surrounding and protecting that joint. Hmm. Um, hydration can be another factor too, so I should throw that in there. Uh, but basically, uh, what you can do, um, first of all, is deep tissue work. So twice a week, I do a full deep tissue mobility workout. Um, today is one of the days that I'll be doing that workout, but basically involves 60 minutes of just making love to foam rollers, the cross balls, like hitting every little nook and cranny of my body. Hmm. And I have a video on YouTube. What I do is I get the most bang for my buck from a workout standpoint by mixing that up with like jumping jacks and 
burpees and lunges and arm swings and leg swings. So I'm getting a mix of deep tissue work to ensure that those tendons and ligaments and fascia surrounding the joints really don't have a lot of knots and cross-linking in them. But then I'm also increasing blood flow and hydration to the joint in between each of those moves. So that's, that's really good. There are books like Kelly Starrett's Becoming a Supple Leopard. Um, there's another book called The Melt Method, which is really good. But, but those books have really, really good instructions for basically taking any joint that hurts and coming at it from a variety of angles. Um, traction is really important too. So I use both these super duper tight elastic bands to attach one end to an immovable object like a railing and the other end to a joint that I want to pull apart like a shoulder or an elbow or a hip or anything else that's hurting. Mm. And you literally just like pull yourself away from that object with the band. You're, you know, it's, a, it's like the old medieval uh, torture practice of quartering someone. You're kind of doing that to yourself. Um, don't use a horse. Use, use something a little bit more predictable than that, preferably. But basically, it's, it's this concept called traction. I also hang upside down from an inversion table for a very similar effect on my hips and my back, etc. So I'm a huge fan of deep tissue work, huge fan of dynamic arm swings and leg swings, huge fan of traction. And then finally, from a supplement standpoint or a nutrient standpoint, there are a variety of really good anti-inflammatory compounds that help with joint pain. Um, some would be, for example, turmeric or curcumin. Um, ginger is really good. Tart cherry extract is really good. Glucosamine chondroitin is really good. Um, I actually, I've, I've personally designed an actual joint support compound that, that I sell on my website called Nature Flex. That's just a combination of like 20 different supplements and ingredients designed to enhance joint pain. And again, just like you can't out supplement your way to higher testosterone if you have a bad lifestyle, you can't out supplement your way out of joint pain if you have, if you're not including like the deep tissue work and stuff like that. But that would be, that would be helpful too from a nutrient standpoint to throw that kind of stuff in. So when you mentioned dynamic arm swings and leg swings, I'm guessing those aren't weighted. No, they're not weighted. Just, just freestanding, you know, leg swings, arm swings. I mean, it's, it's really not rocket science, but it helps a ton to just move the body through that full range of motion. That's also why I'm a fan of, um, there's, there's a lot of cool positive sexual effects of this form of yoga. One thing that it does is it does involve a lot of movement through dynamic ranges of motion. That would be Kundalini yoga. Um, not only is, is the breath work and the energy work great for sex, but a lot of the leg swinging and the arm swinging that you do during that specific form of yoga really help with mobility in the joints as well would the deep stretching in forms of yoga like yin yoga and restorative yoga also help with alleviating tension and joint pain or are those two static for what you'd be looking for only if you're also doing deep tissue work like foam roller work and lacrosse ball work and things that that really dig into the tissue or even massage and the reason for that is that if you think about a, a rope that has a knot in it, for example, if you pull hard on both ends of that rope, what's going to happen? Right, the knot's going to get tighter. So you want to make sure you work out the knot, and then you'd be safer stretching a muscle. I haven't found stretching to be that good for joint pain, though, in the, in the absence of other mobility work. Gotcha. Are there like three to five foods, like whole foods, not necessarily um, – spices or salt or anything but three to five foods that you ensure that you have on a daily basis that are your like go-to superfoods mm. that mean the most to you i vary my foods quite a bit and there's a lot of research that shows that that getting exposure to a variety of different like wild plant extracts and stuff like that is really really good for uh everything from like your your microbiome you know the diversity of bacteria in your gut to the variety of different oxidants that you get exposed to little little stressors from plants that you get exposed to on a daily basis so um i can't say that i have many like staples or or go-tos in my diet as far as specific foods i can tell you i go out of my way to eat somewhere in the range of 20 to 25 portions of plants per day Meaning that that's everything from kale to mint to cilantro to parsley to nettles to plantain to dandelion leaf to just about any form of plant I can get my hands on. So I do a huge variety of plants that returns full circle to what we talked about earlier, the presence of chlorophyll in your bloodstream along with light. 
Um, are those just in the form of like smoothies and salads every day? Like what physical format are you doing? Smoothies, salads, lots of chewing. Yep, exactly. Two, two liquids you'll find in my, actually three that you'll find in my refrigerator that I'm pretty much using almost every day. Number one would be bone broth. Number two would be a chia seed slurry or like I take chia seeds. I soak them with water and I use those as a base for things like smoothies or drinks. You know, it goes well as with lemon juice, stevia, sea salt, et cetera, as a base for smoothies. Um, and then kombucha, which is just a fermented tonic that's really, really rich in bacteria. So we've got a huge number of plants, chia seed slurry, bone broth, kombucha, um, Probably the last thing that that I have almost every day are just like Wild Planet or Bella uh, sardines. Um, the wild plant also does anchovies and mackerel. My body does really, really well though with fatty fish. I feel like a million bucks when I get a good serving of fatty fish every day. So, um, you know, typically just about every day I'm having some kind of like sardine or anchovy or mackerel or like fatty fish with the oil. It's funny, you know, going into this interview, I knew. I've been for everyone watching. I've been following Ben's content for at least two or three years now, and there there are a few things that I was aware of that you've had as influence in my life. I was like, oh yeah, like like blocking glasses and recovery bits, energy bits, and uh, noon tablets whenever I have, <laughs> whenever I drink wine or have any slight hangover for hydration and uh, electrolytes and all that. But until you mentioned those three things, I forgot that kombucha, the chia seed slurry, and bone broth, like all three things that I literally have in my fridge and freezer right now that I forgot came from you. And the, the chia seed That's funny. slurry especially, uh, you helped out our, our mutual friend, Sean, and he told me about that as a tip from you. And yeah, it was just, you know, put this, I forget what it was called, like not broken cell wall, but like broken or cracked uh, yeah. black chia seeds that you soak in, you know, you mix in some hot water, let it soak overnight. I also throw in a tablespoon of coconut oil. And I'll either add uh, cinnamon and maybe banana in it as its own standalone breakfast or just take the bowl that I've made the night before and just dump it into my smoothie. But yeah, I forgot that that, was a, that that was a Ben Greenfield approved tip. Awesome. Awesome. I love it. And uh, I, I got to go soon, but a, but a pretty uh, kind of... Kind of- Kind of a quick fun fact about that noon that you held up, those electrolyte tablets. Um, the guy that used to own that company pivoted and went into the marijuana space, and he owns some some pretty big cannabis companies now. But just on the topic of sex and testosterone, my wife and I actually use one of his products. It, it's called Bond Sex Oil, and it's actually like a THC-infused lubricant for sex. And, and it was originally – are designed by the same guy that makes those those noon electrolyte tablets. So just like a super super duper weird crossover. Now he's not he's not doing noon anymore. But uh, this stuff's called uh, Bond Central Oil, and it's a, a THC infused sex lubricant. That's amazing. Yeah, and yeah. I'll be linking to everything that Ben's mentioned throughout the entire show in the show notes. Uh, you can find much more, and I deeply encourage you to check out Ben at BenGreenfieldFitness.com. Uh, ben, anything I missed? Anything? That I should be touching on before we head off here. Oh, you know we 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 didn't even even talk about like herbs and supplements and stuff like that. Um, but I would say, um, you know that the there's there's constantly research on on different things that will do a good job increasing testosterone. But one of the ones that that I've been using lately, um, based off a, stu- a study that was done on it, is blue spruce oil. You ever use this? Never even heard of it, no. It acts it acts a little little bit similar to pine pollen extract, which you've probably heard of yeah. as one way to increase testosterone. So a few drops of blue spruce oil in like a morning glass of water. You can get this from any essential oil company. It tastes like you're drinking a, a forest, more or less. It's very, very piney type of taste. That's actually something that's been shown in clinical research to increase serum testosterone levels. Um, and, and I'm all about anything natural like that, like a natural plant extract or a natural tree extract. So um, there's there's a fun one for you to look into, blue spruce extract. That's something I've been messing around with lately, and uh, I like the effects. So. Have you gotten yours just in an essential oil store, or do you like a particular brand on Amazon, or what have you been using? I use the uh, the Young Living essential oils. You know, there, there's a lot of different essential oils out there, right? like doTERRA and Mountain Rose Herbs and Young Living. So just look for something quality. Gotcha. 
Amazing. Fan, this is absolutely one of the funnest and most valued, valued dance hour long interviews I've ever been a part of. So thank you so much for being on the show. This was cool. awesome. Yeah, happy to help. I will have to do it again to, to just delve into even more. But but thanks for having me on, dude. I'm honored. My pleasure.